say say welcome to everybody who has joined us today for uh, this week's seminar today we are very very pleased to have one of our own staff members these days professor stefan brick professor of scandinavian studies and he's of course incredibly well known within um, circles of uh, viking studies and people who are working on medieval scandinavia and the so wider medieval world so um, Stefan has held a number of appointments. He was a professor at Aberdeen, um, and he's also held professorships in, in Bergen, in Norway, uh, in Uppsala, Sweden, etc. Uh, he's incredibly well known for his work on Old Norse philology, um, lots of groundbreaking work on, work on place names, uh, on Old Norse law and assembly, um, etc. Um, so we're very much looking forward to hearing his presentation today, which uh, will cover um, Old Norse mythology and sort of the value of, of onomastics for that. So I think uh, we will let Stefan speak. And after um, his presentation is finished, you can all ask questions and you can use the Q&A function, which you will see at the bottom of your screens. So I'll give the, the word to, to Stefan just now and you can share his PowerPoint. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon to everybody, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I can see Donna on the screen. Can you give me a thumbs up, Donna, if you can hear me? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, when I was, was asked if I could give, give a seminar, uh, I gave a couple of uh, suggestions for topics and Alex thought that this one that I'm going to present today could be appropriate for a seminar. Before I start, I, I, should, I should set the stage, so to say, uh, because uh, this is a recycling, or a, I, I'm reusing a large part of the seminar of what I'm going to talk about. It goes back to a, 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 a paper I gave in Bergen last year. We have, for nearly 10 years now, had a uh, annual uh, seminar on Old Norse mythology. And last year it was in Bergen. And to that one, the the organizer had asked us to ask the, the, the speakers to reflect upon our sources for the study of uh, Old Norse mythology. And in my case, then, I was asked to reflect upon the possibility and, 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 and the use of place names in the study of Old Norse mythology. So that was, so to say, what was given to me. Uh, and therefore, uh, I have this angle in this in this paper. And what I'm the 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 paper the talk consists of first of all then with this kind of uh, direction I was giving. First of all, it is a a, a crash course on onomastics, why and how we do place name studies quickly to set the stage, so to say, for for what, what I was saying, then going to talk about in the cases that we're going to discuss. Uh, and uh, I ended that session and also today with the situation today of doing this kind of research in Scandinavia. And that was rather, that, that was picked up by Norsk Kringkastning, the radio of uh, Norwegian radio, state radio, that was there as I was interviewed and asked, what is going on? What's happening? So at the end of the paper, you will understand how I was able to stir up, so to say, the at least the Norwegian public. That's the background of the talk. So here we go. I'm going to share the PowerPoint with you now.
I reuse this old Shakespearean quotation, what's in a name that you have seen so often. So why study onomastic for the sake of all Norse mythology? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, and the background to this is, if I can get all of these, a quick research history of how we, this topic subject came about. There are some founding fathers males normally until the 1930s, 40s. Uh, names like Andreas Tobias, Ellen Pedersen, Pia Munk, Sophus Bugg, Göran Sahlgren, Eilid Ekvall, etc. Who were they? Well, probably the first one who made some serious academic study of place names was a professor of history in, uh, in Lund who wrote a book, Descania Antiqua, already 1706, which is actually rather accurate in many, many aspects. We, we can name him the, the first academic scholar of place name studies, if you like. But then, in this 1980s nation-building period, the period of Romanticism, the period of historicism, we have some giants like P. R. Munk, professor of history in Oslo. He wrote already in the 1840s, published 1850s circa, a, a book which is a history, an overview over the hist uh, early history of Scandinavia. And as a appendix to that one, he wrote this piece called Norrene Gude och Heltesign, Old Norse Gods and Hero Tales, which is surprisingly accurate. And it has been reworked and re-edited and re, re, uh, republished for many, many years, long into the 20th century. Pia Munk was a, a, a brilliant scholar, as many as you know, uh, so it was not surprising, perhaps, that he was able to do that kind of pioneer work. Another one was the professor of Scandinavian language in, in Oslo, a Norse philology, Sophos Bugge, another absolute brilliant scholar who laid the foundation Runology, Old Norse literature, Old Norse poetry, the sagas, the mythology, etymology, place name, folklore, etc., etc. A man with many, many talents. Uh, and I come back to Sophus you know, in, in a while. A little later was came Gustav Indreby, who who was a professor in Bergen who wrote a couple of important monographs, but most importantly in this respect is that he established the Norsk Stanam Kiv, the, the place name archive in Oslo, 1921, together with the historian Edvard Bull and the philologist Magnus Olsen. Interestingly enough, Indreby also wrote a methodological handbook that every Norwegian student doing onomastic have used until today, more or less. Magnus Olsen, professor of the, uh, the professor of chair in Oslo after Sofus Bugge. This is my guru in academia. He was a brilliant scholar. He had many, many talents. He laid the foundation, if you like, to runology in Norway and to place name studies in with a contextual aspect. He was a daring scholar, he, one, of one, one of these scholars who were so in, innovative, who dared take up complicated problems. He, his most famous book came 
1926. Ettergård och helgdom, Farms and Fanes of Ancient Norway, translated two years later, which is still unsurpassed uh, as a overview of the uh, Scandinavian, especially Norse place names, with a contextual, historical, anthropological uh, aspect. This book is still used, it's, it's still readable, but it's still used. And when people use this book today, they, they say how wrong it is. And I be, become so angry because it's so unfair to Martin Sulzen, because he wrote this in a, a situation in the 1920s of the knowledge of history, archaeology, and place name studies in the 1920s. And of course, things have developed since then. It's like comparing a, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari with a T Ford. You don't do that. But you should read it if you are have interest in this topic because it's, it is very, very good for this time. Again, in this vein, a, what came Professor Jan Shan as? He was a historian but also educated in philology, or Norse philology. One of the most important interdisciplinary scholars working with place names, and wrote a lot of important pieces on, on how to work with place names to understand early history. Uh, I had the pleasure and, and the luck to have Professor Jörn Schalnes, at the time he was the Vice Chancellor of Trondheim University. I, I, I had the privilege of having Jörn as the opponent, as we say in Sweden, uh, during my PhD viva in Uppsala 1990. And it, it, I was so fed up with my PhD work at that time and, and the little book I had produced. But after those two hours of discussion with Jörn, I, I found it really interesting to, with because he he made he, he he should have been should have been a, a, a strict opponent, but he he made this into a very interesting discussion during these two hours. The one who laid the foundation in Sweden was Göran Solgre, came from Lund, uh, but got a chair, the first professorship in place name studies in the world, 1930 at Uppsala University. He was an extremely dynamic scholar. There were two young associate professors in Lund in the 1910 and 20s. Uh, docent. One was Göran Solgren, who was at that time working with uh, uh, tales, old uh, Swedish tales, and also old place names. And the other one was Karl Otto von Sydow, who and these both were trying to carve out a new discipline for themselves, Karl Otto in uh, folklore and Göran Salgren in place name studies. And both succeeded, as you perhaps know. <coughs> he established the first journal, academic journal in toponymy in onomastics, Namnobygd, 1913. And he's established the Swedish place name archive 1928 in Uppsala. Probably the most prolific onomastician in Europe since the 1970s was Torsten Andersson, the successor, uh, uh, one, two, three, fourth successor to Göran Salgren on the chair of onomastics in Uppsala. He has been tremendously important for research in Scandinavia and in Europe. Uh, he was also my supervisor. Iceland had an interesting scholar, Thorhatler Wilmundarsson, the director of Örnöppnastopnen Islands, uh, who also was a, 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 a very fine Old Norse literary historian. Uh, but he was, as I said, the director of the place name studies in, in, in Iceland. He was interesting in, in that respect in this respect, talking what I'm talking today, that he denounced the possibility of finding cult names and 
sacred names in Iceland. Everyone, potential one, he denounced and said they have a secular interpretation. The successor to, to uh, Thor Hitler was Svavar Sigmundsson, who became the director of Örnöppnastopnum, had a, a, shall we say, a, a, a more uh, accommodating approach to the potential sacred place names in Iceland. Very good scholar as well. For Finland, perhaps the most uh, interesting scholar of the toponymist there and the director of the place name archive was Kurt Siliakus, who wrote a very important book, 1966. It's a, a case study from Western, uh, southwest of Finland. He was probably our foremost uh, theorist in onomastics. Uh, and he had a very linguistic perspective and approach to the study of place names. Very interesting scholar to discuss with. Outside of Scandinavia then, well, a, a, a very important scholar was Adolf Bach, Bach in, in Germany for, for German place name studies, who wrote the Deutsche Namenkunde, two volumes uh, in the 1940s. It's a very good general overview. He was building on the Scandinavian uh, forefathers, if you like. He is a somewhat contaminated scholar uh, because he was part of the SS in the 1930s, 40s, but he was rehabilitated and, and, and there was uh, allowed into the academic uh, uh, world again in the 50s and 60s. What about the English or British place name situation? Well, the founding father, if you like, was this one, Eilert Ekvall, professor of English at Lund University in Sweden. Everyone who has touched upon uh, English place names have come across his, this monumental work the concise Oxford Dictionary of English Place Names that has been reprinted and new editions, many, many one, fourth, fifth, sixth edition. Uh, and it was Eilert and his disciples who wrote the many important monographs of English Place Names in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s. What about today? Well, in my opinion, the most interesting place name scholar in England is uh, David Parson, who used to be in Nottingham at the uh, Place Name Society in Nottingham, uh, now in Aberystwyth. He's also a brilliant scholar, an uh, uh, interesting scholar. Scotland, my colleague in Aberdeen, Professor Bill Nicolaisen, who used to be in Binghamton in the States, but then came back to Aberdeen. He used to be the head of Scottish Place Name Survey in Edinburgh, and he has written these really good overviews over Scottish Place Names, sadly missed. Today we have one of the most energetic and interesting and, 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 and always lovely, interesting to listen to, Simon Taylor, Glasgow, uh, another brilliant scholar that I enjoy to listen to so much. And let me give you Another hint of an interesting place name scholar who works in this interdisciplinary way. Keith Basil, professor of Yale and, and later New Mexico. He has written a book that is a book on onomastics, although he's an anthropologist, but what he is using place names to discuss Native Americans' uh, life in this book, Wisdom Sits in Place, Landscape and Language Among the Western Apache. And, and if you're interested to see how you can work with, with Basso's work, I, I, I've written about him and his research in this article called Mytholo Mythologizing Landscape that is printed in a festschrift, Continuitet non Brüche in the Religionsgeschichte, for anyone interested. So, the most important is this guy, 
is Olof Rygg, professor of archaeology in Oslo in the mid 19th century and the second part of the second half of the 19th century. He was the professor of, of archaeology, archaeology, as I said, but he, he was engaged by the Norwegian parliament who in the, the wake of P.A. Munk and the other historians and philologists work in Norway to try to, to motivate an independent Norway. We, we're talking 19th century, we're talking the, the nation building period and nationalism, of course. And of, since Denmark had been part, sorry, Norway had been part of Denmark for hundreds of years, it had been Danish sized in many, many aspects. And so was also the Norwegian matricule, the names, the cadastral of the names of the farms in Norway that had been given over the hundreds of years, a Danish flavor that had been Danish sized. So the parliament asked three colleagues uh, in, at the university to change these names to so they become Norwegian again. And they, the chair of that was Olaf Rygg and the other one was uh, Sofus Bugge and, and there was one more historian. And, and uh, so the, 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 they, had, they were asked to, to make these name Norwegian again. And Olaf Rygg started to do, do this in a very serious way. He understood quickly, although an archaeologist, that you have to understand the background to the name before you can get a proper Norwegian name on the farm again. So for, to do this, he realized, you have to have three things on the table. First of all, you have to have a early, as early written form as possible for Scandinavia pre-1500, a medieval form, preferably. The second thing is you should have a genuine dialect pronunciation of the place name, because he knew, and Sophus Bugge probably told him, that dialects are a kind of a refrigerator of the language. And the third thing that was necessary, they realized, was you have to have knowledge from the place which where the name, the, the denotation of the name in the actual, actual world. So you have to know how it looked like, so to say, at the place of the name. So they, he started with, with, with this operation and he sat with assistants at the histo uh, historical document archive in Oslo and excerpted all the names found in medieval documents in Oslo, a huge undertaking, written on small papers that made up sort of the start of the place name archive. Of course, he couldn't go around in Norway asking people of how do you pronounce your place name, your farm name. So they came to the conclusion that let's go to the regiments around Oslo and ask these young men who were drafted into these regiments that came from all over Norway, how they pronounced their names in their parish. So that was the dialect. And for the denotation of these sites, he wrote to the parish priests around in, in Norway and asked them, how does it look at this site? What is the terrain? Is this river has an, some, some special characteristic is the water clear or muddy or whatever these kind of things and out from this he could produce a proper form norwegian name for this form he realized and so so for spoke about all of especially that this is a unique fantastic material we have to publish it so they published they started to publish all this knowledge in what is called Norske Gårdnavne in 19 volumes, started 1898. I think I have a picture of 
looks like this. And in this Norske Gårdnam, you will, you will find the, na place of the, uh, the name of the place, the farm, how it is pronounced, uh, early, early uh, forms of the names, and then a, an explanation of, of, of the name. This became the foundation for modern place name studies, methodologically. And this became the, uh, the model for the rest of the world, more or less, or well, the rest of the world, how you should do this kind of research. So we, we got these uh, new place name archives in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, Germany, France, England, and then United States, Australia, New Zealand, which is based, so to say, on this Gunnarske Gårdnamen and Olof Rygg's idea. And if, you haven't, if you're not a toponymist yourself, but you have perhaps come across place names and place name studies and interpretation, perhaps you have asked yourself, why study names? Why study place names? Well, it goes back to, to this. This is a stupid example, but it, 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 it makes the point why it is important to study names. You have a lake in front of you. And if you imagine that around this lake, you are walking around this lake in the Neolithic, in the Stone Age, and it is forest all over the place. And when people come to this lake, they, they notice it's a big lake. And after a while, when you communicate to people around in the area, you, you refer to this big lake as uh, the big lake. And after a while, everyone knows that when I say the big lake, everyone knows I'm referring to this water. 1,000 or 4,000 years later, this lake is drained and it is a wet meadow, and that meadow is called the wet, uh, the big lake. 500 years later, it is more, more drained, and it's now used as an arable land of the farmer who lives by the lake. And the, the uh, arable land, the former big lake, the arable land is called big lake. In modern time, when the farm is gone and the arable land is gone, they build a Tesco supermarket here. And they use the former arable land as a parking lot. And when you enter this parking lot by the Tesco, it says, welcome to the big lake parking. No one hesitates to park their car on this lake, or rather on this parking called the big lake. Why? because place names have no etymological meaning. Place names have semantics, of course. They have connotations. If I say Stockholm, what pops up in your mind, in your brains is, ah, the capital of Sweden. You might have been there, so pictures come about. But no one of you starts to say, ah, oh, hmm. Stock, uh, Bridge, Early Bridge, Holm, uh, Island. We don't etymologize place names. So what has happened? Well, the crucial point is when the people in the Neolithic, in this case, started to use this linguistic entity, the Big Lake, as a name for precisely this lake, not anyone else. So the word or the, the, the linguistic entity uh, became a name. We call this the proprialization of this linguistic entity. And what happens during this proprialization process is that that linguistic entity loses all meaning. But instead, what is what was, so to say, the, the semantic content of that linguistic entity before the proprialization process is petrified, is forever, so to say, 
embedded in this name. That's why we, 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 in, we analyze place names. We try to squeeze out this information that we find in this place name by this method that Ulla Brygg have presented us with. That's why it is a, a crash course, so to say, for why we do this research. And of course, it's not much in each, each name. It's, it's a, a tiny, tiny little information that you find. If you think of all the millions of names that we have around us, it is a fantastic material if we can squeeze out information from as many as, as possible and date them, etc., to have a, 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 an asset of information from different times in, in the landscape. So we, we can say that uh, we human beings, we use the language to transform the objects in the landscape into names. So coming over to sacred and cultic place names, mythological, mythological world. As we saw with P.R. Munch, one of the first thing these scholars who were found place names as an interesting source was the usage of these place names to squeeze out information of the pre-Christian religion, like Pea Munch did. And that continued in the whole of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And scholars at that time, they were bold. Especially Magnus Olsen. Uh, he, he, he wrote a, 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 a large book, Hedenes Kult Minder in Norsk Stetsnam, where he collected everything he knew of, of uh, pagan uh, cult names, pagan cult names in, in Norway. It is a highly uncritical book. You should read it carefully, but it is a fantastic uh, thing that was produced already in 1915. Typical among the souls. Uh, and one who, who reacted to this, uh, shall we say, frivolous use of the research in this respect was Jonas Solgren in Uppsala. He started a campaign uh, from the 1920s that culminated with an article in 1950s, which is called Hedner Pagan uh, Studies of, of the, uh, the Gods in Scandinavian place names, published in Amnabygd, where he dismissed more or less everything that Magnus Olsen and people before 1950 had written about place name studies and Old Norse mythology. As since he was the only professor in the world in place name studies, he had an enormous impact on the study. No one after this article dared to work with sacred place names in Sweden and partly also in Norway, Norway, Denmark, for decades. So it, the, lock, the lid was on until 1986, where the then professor Lars Helberg in Uppsala wrote an article of the pre-Christian traces of, of pagan pre-Christian place names in Uppland. He had been working silently and secretly during the 1950s and 60s and 80s, 70s and 80s on this, and he was our foremost expert in, in, in Scandinavia on this. And he dared to produce this article, uh, finally. Uh, and that became the new start of the study of place name studies place names used in mythological Old Norse uh, studies. And after this, it, it just exploded. Sorry. So, in the 1920s, Erik Norén, the, the son of uh, Adolf Norén, a, a name you might know from his, his grammars of old Icelandic language, etc. Erik was, was a professor in Uppsala in Scandinavian philology. He dared to, try to, to interpret the name Kove in central Sweden, medieval form Kvadovi, 
we recognize the word V, holy place, German Weihnachten, holy. And he interpreted this name as a cult site where we have this kind of raising cult. And he made this link to a raising cult, which we think we know of from the Bronze Age. And he was immediately slaughtered by Göran Sahlgren as this is absolutely not acceptable for modern research to have this kind of well, nonsense, he said. Another one that he was, Göran Sahlgren was uh, very opposing was Jalmar Lindroth, who in a, 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 a contribution discussing the place names, plural, Hernvi, which according to Jalma Lindroth, well, there are several Erna Tuna, Erna V, Herna V, with this, we, it has been interpreted as a goddess Horn, Hörn, Frey, Freya perhaps, a, a Bynen, or the word Arin, Her. No, according to this brave Jalmar <coughs> Lindroth, this was Arnir, a snake dragon demon watching over a burial place. Of course, it was too much for Joros Hagen. So again, slaughtered. So if we took a look at the cases, how we can do this kind of research. We have, for example, in central Upland, this place, Mark Orchestra, which is a fantastic place to visit. And it's actually uh, has been part of the UNESCO World Heritage List as a landscape because it has preserved a Viking Age feature in the landscape, very unique in a way. You have two uh, probably early, early Iron Age sent, uh, names, Mark Hem name and a, a Tuna name. And up here at Vax Tuna, we have a, a place named Vibi, recognize the V which means the farm by or beside a cult site. We have a strange place named down here, a star name with the first element Vivin and a Husabi, which we can identify as a early medieval royal estate farm, one a part of the Buna Regalia for the Swedish king, Svea king. So we probably had a pagan cult site up here, a V, and down here, this V Vista, early writ, written forms shows that the first element is a word Vivil, which according to Lars Helberg denotes a pagan cult leader, and a word Husar, which is a, an old central, central place word, name, sorry, uh, for a prehistoric central place. We can con continue with Fall Big, and this is west of east of Gothenburg, a very, very old landscape settlement district, where we have in the central part of Fall Big, then this again a Tuna name, Hem names, and then we have the cultic Fliggeroker, the only exponent of the female goddess Frigg in Scandinavia, most certainly. Odensberg, Ullarvi, Golden Ull, the strange Götavi, the cult site of the Götar, strange. Alvin, this enigmatic Salibi, Saler perhaps, linked to Uppsala, etc. So you can work with these kind of names and try to understand what went on in this landscape and uh, during early Iron Age and late Iron Age. This is the best example I have in Scandinavia. It is uh, east, north, northeast of Falbygden. It's between Stockholm and Gothenburg. You have the arrow here. It's called Vadsbo. That is the district name. We don't know, so to say, of the, the uh, I should say, it's an administrative district name. We don't know the, the district names 
that is lost. This is the best example we, ha we have in, in Scandinavia of what looks like a, a uh, early Irish to us or an Anglo-Saxon petty kingdom or something like that. But we, we, we don't have the, the written sources to, to show us this. But you have the place names and it looks like this. We have scattered around in this place, in the landscape, these names denoting different gods and goddesses on farms. Why did they have, want to live among their gods and goddesses? We don't know, but there you are. And we can also identify again the, the area of power, if you like, the tuna name and the retinue in a very strategic position, and then the, the core of the center with many archaeological features that, that, that the sense uh, power, prehistoric power. Here's another case. It is the largest island on Lake Malaren, just outside Stockholm, called the uh, Selaj. Again, scattered around the island, we have these names of gods and goddesses, Freya's Grove, Freight Grove, God, the goddess Njär, the staff, Ulr's Grove, Odin's Oak Grove, etc. And again, we can identify the central place, the power with the tuna name, the retinue, Husby, and then a rune stone talking about a place, a, a, a thing site, etc. If you have ever landed at Arlanda Airport in Stockholm, you have landed close to this one, which has given the name to the airport, Arlanda. Arland was a prehistoric, uh, small, perhaps we, we can say petty kingdom. Of, we, it's a land, Falkland, if you like. And again, it is possible to identify a sacred landscape with God's names, goddesses' names, interesting archaeological features, and again, the power center with the Saturna and Hustby, etc. So, well, I've been able to identify something like 12, 14 of these kind of cases that looks like this. And, and again, <clears throat> we have to all of these uh, an inlet from a lake or a, 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 a the sea into this settlement district. And it looks like this if we should have a model of it with <clears throat> an inlet with a Seatuna and a Husby. We have this retinue, strange name, gods, goddesses, often a smedvi, the form of the smith, and other names. And they occur again and again and again as some kind of a, a model of more or less in the landscape. And we can play around with this. This is what we found in our land when the, it looked like that, and Östchin in eastern Sweden. And it, this was Fall Big that we saw when it looked like this. And Valsbo had the same situation where you, you, it didn't, the, it, the, the, the rivers did not go out to the sea, but to the largest lake in Scandinavia, Lake Werner. And CLI had this configuration. So this is, so to say, what, what I have found. And, and I've presented, and it builds on research by Lars Helmer, especially. And then my, my friend and colleague, uh, Mats Wiedgren, that you always should listen to, a professor of, uh, on cultural history in, in Stockholm, he always have been nagging on me. How can you, if these names are contemporary? And I can't. But that is for me the next step. Now I, I have identified this kind of uh, uh, picture, this kind of, of, of milieus in these landscape districts. The next phase is to try to, to date. And <clears throat> this is something that me and a, a, a former PhD student and postdoc to me, Per Wikstrand, Per Wikstrand, we have a, a, a project here in Uppsala where we are trying to understand these important tuna names uh, and date them and, and try to understand them in the better way because they are crucial 
in these complexes. So, the importance of, of interdisciplinary collaborations. This is the best example I have. <clears throat> it goes back to the excavation, the largest archaeological ex excavation ever in, in Norway, the Kaupang excavation that's gone on for de decades. In the 1980s, uh, so 1990s, uh, the, the leadership of that was taken over by Professor Dag Finskri in Oslo uh, in a large project and he involved me in the project and, and instead of just focusing as the research before on the archaeology at Kaupang, he broadened the perspective and I was asked to look at the area around Kaupang to see what the place names in a landscape setting said, which I did. And <clears throat> the compelling found finds I, I was able to do was a dried out lake that had the old name Vitrir or Vetrir, which we can translate as the lake dedicated to deities or gods. There were cooking pits, communal cooking pits at a place called Schölling, old, old Norse form Theodaling, the people's assembly place, it means, to where the Paris church later was, was built. Dolphin pointed out to me there is a Helga Fjetl by the lake, and I didn't believe him until I understood he's right, a holy mountain. There was a place called Husebi, again, a name you recognize now. And in the Middle Ages, we saw from document that the name of Husebi was Skiring Saler. It's the same Saler we have in Uppsala, for example. And the word Skiring is difficult to understand. It has been interpreted as a by name for Freyr or, or a, a name of the, of the Saler, so to say. And that for me, having the knowledge from Sweden and Uppsala, I said to Dogfin, you must put the shovel there because you will probably find a, 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 a hall, hall building. The name denotes a hall. He did, and they found this hall building, banqueting hall, in the place on this elevated plateau. So we have a lot of components here that it's interesting to see in this interplanary study of, of this, not the Kaupang, but the whole um, uh, area around Kaupang. So we have the assembly site, the, where people assembled. We had the cooking pits linked, obviously, to this assembly site. We had this hall building, the banqueting hall, that later on became the medieval uh, royal estate, royal manor. We had the Copan, the trading place and harbor. We had this holy lake and this uh, holy mountain that probably denotes some kind of a cultic area up here. So, thanks to the names, thanks to archaeology and the landscape analysis, it is possible to ask the question. Who controlled all this? Who, who, is, who is the prime mover, so to say, in this landscape? Well, of course, it's the king in the hall. He controlled the, the, the Kaupang, the harbor and the trading place. If he controlled also the communal thing assembly, that's another interesting question that can be asked. But this is a very good example of how you can work, work together with your colleagues in other disciplines closely and identify these kind of, squeeze out this information that in this case comes from the, the Viking Age mainly. And I think I, I'll end, uh, end with this quickly. It is a recent excavation in, in Stockholm, outside Stockholm, in a place called Ullevi, which means, of course, the cult site dedicated to the god Uller. It, uh, looks like this. Here is a, a, an impediment, a, a small hill, which was excavated and they found this, what probably is a platform and some kind of cult building. And it was, this hill was scattered with 
with uh, objects from these uh, uh, rituals and cultic activity of this place. So we, we, we start to get knowledge of these outdoor cult sites where the place name is the indicator for, for the archaeologist. Let's go back to, uh, finally to Eric Morian and his core interpretation. Kvava V, the race cult site of the racing cult that was totally dismissed to the extent that he stopped actually doing research in place names. He was so devastated with, by this critique. A couple of, uh, 10 years ago something, there was this new uh, excavation west of Stockholm at a place called Lunda, which means grove, and that you have the expectation, is it a, uh, is it a sacral grove or is, a, is it a profane grove? Well, the excavation was absolutely fantastic. They found this long house, different uh, layers. They found these uh, silver and gold figurines of probably small goddess or gods or whatever, if you like. But most importantly in this respect is that with the, at this site was the little hillock. And they excavated this little hillock and they found all over the place small charcoal pits and spread all over the area they found small small pellets of uh, raisin so uh, was he right well what we can learn from this is Whenever you're doing research that is 1,000, 2,000 years old, so to say, trying to understand this landscape and these people and, and, and their history, be humble. We don't know everything. Don't be too critical because sometimes you end up like this and you can see that maybe Erik Norea was right. There was a racing cult at this sacred, sacred place. So you work with place names, you aggregate the names and you can map these gods and goddesses in Scandinavia and you can show that what we read in the Icelandic sagas of the pagan religion is not something that was found all over Scandinavia. For example, the god Tyr, this enigmatic god, seems only to have a, 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 a cult in Denmark only, not in the rest of Scandinavia. And Ulfir and also Freyr is particularly a god that had a cult in Svea area in Sweden and around Oslo for some reason, etc, etc. So place names also gives us geography into the study of the Old Norse religion, that we are not, we, we don't get, so to say, from the other sources. So, why don't we find the same milieus in, in Norway, Denmark, in Gotland as we find in South Sweden? I was going to skip this, but quickly, it is because something has happened in on Gotland, great devastation of, of uh, uh, prehistoric names, on Jutland, a total extinction of medieval names, uh, sorry, prehistoric names in principle, apart from parish names, all on the same, etc. So, and that is not the case, I should say, that for parts of Norway and central Sweden. That's why you don't have the same picture all over Scandinavia. Thus, place names are important source for understanding. So, who are doing this research today? I asked the audience at the Bergen conference. Well, today, this is the situation. Toponymy, place name studies, you can collect names, you can plan an administrative names, and you can do research, academic research, interpretation. The heydays, you collected names. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you had this enormous boost of research in academia of place names. Today, it is administration of planning of names in cities and roads and etc. that is big. 
you don't collect anything and research has gone down the drain. The place name archive, the prototype for the rest of the world in Oslo has been closed down. The material has been moved to Berge somewhere. In Copenhagen, just been closed down and the few scholars left has been integrated in larger departments. In Uppsala, the world's largest one in the world has been reduced, practically no researchers left. Umeå, that archive closed down. Lund, closed down. Gothenburg, reduced. So, I asked the audience in Bergen, what's the future for this field? I don't know. Maybe it's gone too far. And we have this knowledge that has, is so true. It is easier to tear down and close, but it's difficult to build up from new. The positive side is outside of Scandinavia, England, and in Scotland, English Place Name Society, Simon Taylor, and others. Where, and we have in Edinburgh, Arne Kruse, Alan McNeven, Shetland, Andrew Jennings, etc., etc. So there is, it is outside of Scandinavia now that we have the, the, an, an intensive uh, work study of, of place names. But the situation in Scandinavia is dire. It's, it's so sad. And after I closed down this paper, I was immediately dragged out of the conference hall by the Norwegian radio and interviewed and said, what shall we do? And I said, I don't know. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for that. Uh, a fabulous, fabulous lecture, even though it had a very sad ending. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it inspire us to do all this research all along, and then we can see that it's, it's going downhill, at least in, in, in Scandinavia, which is in, incredibly um, depressing. Um, so we can, you can maybe see this as a call for other people to pick up the torch and, and carry on. Um, but yes, uh, just if you think of the more positive sides, I really did think that uh, it was so good to get this overview of the research history, how things have developed and how people have agreed and disagreed with each other. <laughs> um, it seems to be one of those things that happens to you with most areas with the sagas and the laws and, and everything. And, you know, I like the thing, you know, be humble. You might not be right and you might not know everything. Something that we can bear in mind, I think. So that's that's really, really useful. Um, so we have questions. I, I can see some questions have come up in the in the Q and A already. Um, so I will, I will start reading them out. Um, and just to everybody who is here, you can uh, put your um, questions in under the uh, Q and A section. And if you make sure that you put it to all panelists, preferably. Um, if you put it to the host, I won't see it because I'm actually not the host of of, of today's meeting. So um, let oh. Let's start with the first question here then. So um, talking about the nationalism um, that you talked about, I think in the beginning of the, of the paper, Stefan, uh, how does this nationalism affect, nationalism affect our use of onomastics? How cautious do we need uh, to be about its impacts? Uh, uh, I don't really understand how it can affect, so to say, nationalism. What, what is interesting with this kind of source, if you compare it with written sources from the Middle Ages, for example, is that this docu the written sources in the Middle Ages are biased, very often extremely biased. They have an agenda by writing the th things they did, for example, Adam of Bremen, had a, a very acute agenda when he wrote his Gesta. Uh, you, you, place names are not biased in that way, so to say, not politically biased, or it doesn't have an agenda. Uh, apart from place names in the new world, 
that has been transferred or or or, or created analogically by by analogy from from the old world. They there you can discuss it. And I actually been to when I. I I had my postdoc in the South Pacific, 1992-93, and I tried to understand the how place name function and was given, etc., among the Polynesians, the Aborigines, etc. And, and in New Zealand, and I was studying, trying to understand the Aborig uh, the the Maori place names, uh, and talk to linguists and language scholars. They they were so. That hesitated immediately when I mentioned that and, and said, oh, oh, yeah, interesting. But you should contact this uh, place name institution in Wellington, capital. Everyone's old. So, so finally, I, I wrote to this place name institute in Wellington, which was a Maori place name institute. And they sent me books of the state accepted interpretation of Maori place names. And I could see that the interpretations they had produced, which was the truth, what these interpretations was what we in, in Europe call folk etymological interpretations. So I said this to the colleagues in Christchurch in Auckland, where I were, and I look at this, this is folk etymology. But doesn't isn't anyone doing some kind of academic studies on this? And they just raised their hand and turn away politically in this respect. And it is politically, it was politically for us, for example, in the old Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union when they changed the names according to the political fashion of today. Chemnitz, Kolmalikstadt. Uh, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then when they collapsed, you have to take back the old name, etc. So, but the old primary names in Scandinavia, England, Scotland, etc., they are unbiased, so to say, in that respect. They are not manipulated in in any way. I hope I understood the question, so to say. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting uh, answer. Um, so I think it's something that you, I think there's a misunderstanding here that you can probably uh, explain. Um, so some places say place names with Lund, Lunda, Bari, etc. make enough sense. But one that stuck out here for me is the Freyas with Roker, as in an R adding to the Orker. Can you explain why there's an R there? Oh, yeah. Because... Uh... No, it isn't a fre it, it's a friger, friger åker. Well, fe, fe, feminine words and names in Old Norse language, in the early Scandinavian language, they have a genitive a, a, a r. And if the following uh, element in the compound starts with a vowel, then the r is kept. If it is a consonant that follows the r, the r is uh, Assimilated with the with the consonant, uh, that is the, w w the way we can we, we can see if it is Frey or Freya, for example, in place names. Uh, does that explain the? That? I think so. I think that yeah. was the question. Yeah. Um, then I have a, just a message from Chris Callow saying he has to go, but he really enjoyed the seminar. So, <laughs> passing us the best wishes there. Um, and then um, so. Um, Luke uh, Murphy, thanks, Stefan. Fascinating as ever. I'm interested in the Jöteva name in Fall of Bygden. Um, who named it if it weren't the Jöteva or Gauta? Well, typically, Luke, you 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 pinpoint the, the the problem here. This is normally when when you have a name with V, cult, pagan cult site, and uh, the first element is. Uh, a group of people, which this obviously is prob perhaps probably, you wouldn't expect that you have the name of yourself, so to say, because it's always neighbors for name. So if if it was uh, a, a Swedish party who, who lived there, the people around there, they could name this 
Svea V because strange enough there were Swedes who were living and having this cult site. But why Göta V? So they have tried to explain this by getting away with rather obvious uh, uh, first element of Göta by saying that maybe it is a by name for Odin, who we know had this strong by name Gauter. Maybe he had a weak by name, Gauti. If that was the case, that could be the first element here. That would be a Gauta V then. But to my knowledge, there are no examples of that Odin had this weak uh, by name. So we, we have a couple of these Gauta V, one here in Falbygden and one up in Narke. Uh, and, and they are really difficult to, to explain, actually. So uh, I rest my case. <laughs> it's a good question, Luke. Thank you. Unfortunately, they can't speak because that's the test for this. So uh, you can continue your discussion at some point. Um, a question here about Shetland. Um, I love the idea about landscape analysis. Could Stefan touch on what we can learn from the influence of place names in Shetland? That's a bit of a wide question. Um, I don't know if you want to comment. I don't know what it is meant by the influence of place name in Scotland. No. Do you? No. Uh, I don't know, Michelle, are you still there? You can always maybe type a, a new a new version of that question and we can come back uh, to that. Um, there's another one. We can move on and we can wait for Michelle to come back to us. Um, um, so Stefan Nissel, who's from um, Eskids Tuna, he was wondering if you could explain that name a little bit and what does it have to do with the process of Christianization? <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, here we have an example of, of, of uh, some uh, what, what might happen sometimes in place name studies or with place names is that you have a you have a, a name in this case simplex tuna, and then people change religion and and the new New Christian people at this place, they 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 add a saint's name to the old tuna. Saint Eskil, isn't he the the saint for Eskil tuna? I think as well, like Butol for Butchirka, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A secondary addition, so to say. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, another question. Do you see the future of onomastics in being more interdisciplinary, like, for example, Keith Basso as being a leading scholar in anthropology? Yes, th that is the, the, the future. And uh, that was what the scholars in the uh, 19th, uh, 19th century understood. Place name is a, by definition, interdisciplinary uh, field. And, and the reason for that is that, that I explained, namely that the name is, of course, a, a name is part of the, grammat, the of, of the grammar, the linguistic grammar is part of the nouns. But you don't have, for example, an archive of adjectives or the, uh, the Swedish archive of adverbs, but you can have for names. Why? Because names are a special entity. They, and the speciality with names is they have a unique denotation out in reality. So the, you have this dual link with the linguistic level, and then you have the denotation out in reality, which is a unique uh, uh, denotation. And it is this. So you have to have this lingu linguistic competence and this landscape competence, if you like, this, this uh, non-linguistic competence. Uh, to be able to work with this. And this is, for me, what makes them so fascinating, because you you can work like a detective then, together with archaeologists, historians, as, and, and, and I say, oh, why, yeah, that's the background. And then you link all this together in name milieus, you work with people like uh, Alexandra and Mats Wiedgren and John Henrik Falgren, etc., archaeologists, and, and, and then you can build up a picture. We can reconstruct a prehistoric landscape, for example, or a medieval landscape in a way that is absolutely fascinating. I can't understand that not people are more interested in this, but it is, of course, a lot of studying to do. You have to be competent in etymology, language history, etc., but also in archaeology and history of a way. 
So yeah, why not take the easy way out? <laughs> Um, thank you. So another question relating to different kinds of sources. Um, do oral sources, for example, storytelling and song have any importance in place name studies? I'm trying to see. Do where can you take it again? Do oral sources, so yep. such as storytelling and song, have any importance in place name studies? In a way, yes. Oral sources. There, I just written a, a piece in in a, a new handbook on oral oral his, oral history that came out last year. Uh, oral history in old Norse uh, in the old Norse uh, world, and what I did there, I I, I identified, I discussed some lists of border markers between Sweden and Norway, where old men had been called to the As Thing Assembly and to enumerate orally lists of 30, 40, 50 lines of place names that they had remembered, which is absolutely astonishing. And that links up to links up with another aspect of or, oral status orality, namely that the background to the old Norse poetry, for example, uh, are did they the the scholars of who told this poetry did they do it verbatim? Do they were they able to remember everything? Well, the standard interpretation is no. They they knew a core that they uh, revolved around in their poetry. But at least these kind of lists I've seen, heard of, read about, they are verbatim. So maybe that also could link into to the uh, Old Norse poetry discussion of orality, perhaps. But otherwise, it's difficult to see the links, so to say, to the question. Yes, thank you. We have millions of questions coming in here. We can maybe carry on a little bit longer, um, if you don't mind, Stefan. Um, so one question is about the decline in sort of the, the archives that you were talking about. And is this to do with research tendencies or is this to, to do with sort of modern uh, financial adjustments? No, it's, 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 it's the, back, the background is uh, personalities. The, the younger generation that that has the, come into the the field, they have other preoccupations. Very often, social linguistic, modern modern aspects. The, the 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 scholars that work with this know their work for very often with the personal names, surnames. One I know work with. How does we are going to incorporate the the new Swedish? Uh, migrants who come to Sweden, their certain names into our naming system, so to say. So it has gone from a, a diachronic study, and the new generation have a synchronic aspect, and very much a, a as I mentioned, a administrative aspect. How do we write the right form on maps? These kind of things. So, and wh why that has happened? I don't really. The change came in the 1980s where these kind of, how shall I not say, I would say political, but uh, to open up the discipline for these kind of more contemporary questions was promoted very much and that was picked up. Uh, whereas perhaps this kind of old digging in, in, in the very, very far past became obsolete in a way, or I don't know, but. That was happening in that case. Mm, uh, that, that's very interesting. Uh, next question, uh, Elizabeth Fitzpatrick. She's shown the, shown the importance of hills in Ireland as installation places of kings and chieftains, as they were important hunting areas due to their importance in attracting deer. Um, could that be similar in Scandinavia?
pro uh, we, we don't know it's, 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 it's the, the correct answer. But of course, I've, I've followed this research on Ireland, extremely important and absolutely fascinating. And there are so many similarities. It's something that I mentioned, Jan Henrik Falgren, I think he was part of the people here as well, listening in. Uh, he has done, he hasn't published, I think, yet, but he has done this kind of comparative analysis with Scandinavia and, and, and early Ireland. Uh, so, but there are specialities in uh, Ireland that I don't see in Scandinavia, at least, uh, re re regarding inaugurations and these kind of things in early Ireland. And regarding hunting areas or deer parks, etc. We know this from the Middle Ages and Middle Ages, I said, uh, uh, post 1100. Uh, for example, outside Lund, we have one of these royal deer parks, but prehistoric, we don't know. Thank you. Uh, a quick question from uh, Chris Morris here, saying fascinating uh, talk, and obviously he's a Viking archaeologist. He's wondering where the uh, research about Skeeting, Saal and, and Kofran, where that's been published. Oh, yes, very much. Uh, Darwin has produced three volumes, uh, probably 1,000 pages each, uh, mm -hmm. the Copan volumes that you can read that, and, and, and uh, also my piece is in the first volume where I have, that I presented today. So, and, and, and all these, all these three are absolutely fascinating because of the, the depth of research and the, the way he has handpicked researchers all over Europe to give their analysis and impression of the finds and the landscape there. So I correct me that, Chris. Okay, we'll carry on a, a, a few more questions, I think. Um, I think this links into your comments about the Maori and, uh, you know, the kind of names there with in, in New Zealand, talking about, asking questions about Sami names and how, you know, the political aspects there and, uh, perhaps the removal of, of Sami place names in favour of Norwegians or, or Swedish place names, if you could just give some thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, that is a very good question. And all these years I've been working with place names in Scandinavia, that is for, since the late 70s. Uh, I've been always trying to find people who had an interest in Sami place names because they're absolutely fascinating, the little I know. So, uh, but there, there are no, no one is, uh, has done that kind of research. There are knowledge, knowledgeable people working with the, the Sami uh, culture, like uh, Håkan Ryd, Wingenbergen, and, uh, and, and Professor Larsson here in Uppsala, etc. So there are potential, but there has not been a kind of a, a modern overview over Sami place names that we could use to compare, so for example. For so Neil Price in his PhD thesis, The Viking Way, are discussing the impact and similarities between the Sami cult, for example, and the Scandinavian Viking cult. So there are so much to do there, and so little has been done, actually. I hope it will change. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to scroll through all the... Uh, I think we'll maybe take one one last question here. Um, this relates to Scotland, so we're really testing you here, <laughs> covering all parts of the world. Um, uh, the Scots took Gaelic folk from Ireland and resituated them in Scotland, so could the same have occurred with pagan place names in the Norse settled areas of Scotland. The Gaels, of course, were Christianized by that time. Um, do you want to comment on that one? I just read, I have it in front of me. The Scots oh, took Gaelic folk tales from Ireland and it resituated them in Scotland. So could the same have occurred with pagan place names in Norse settlers in Scotland? That's a good question. Because we know that uh, Norwegians settling in Shetland, Orkney, if they don't took place names with them and just 
replanted them in Shetland Orkney, it is obvious that they used their onomasticon, their linguist, the, 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 the onomastic competence that they had from the old, from Norway, as a palimpsest or, or, or a model for how place names should be coined, so to say. And we, we have been discussing, especially in the 1980s, if they also brought ready-made names to Shetland Orkney from Norway, for example, and, and we have a couple of cases that looks very probable. So, yeah, why not? Well, that question should be asked to, to Andrew Jennings, for example, and squeeze him, squeeze the time on him and see what he, he thinks about these kind of things. Uh, good question. Yes, I mean, clearly we can could, we could continue this. I think Andrew is teaching today, so he couldn't uh, be here, unfortunately. Um, but we, there are lots of things to, to think about, and uh, I think we'll, we'll carry on these discussions in the future. Um, so I would just like to tell everybody that this uh, is being recorded, so it will be available uh, later on, and we'll put the link up on our website, and you can find it through Facebook and, and Twitter. And I would just like to say thank you so much to Zephron for this fantastic seminar. And we've really had fantastic questions as well. So thank you everybody for coming and, and thank you to, to Stefan. Mille grazie. <laughs> I just scroll down chat, Alex, to see all the interesting questions.